Okay, so we can uh, continue the morning session uh, with uh, Nate uh, Cheplak from uh, local, from, uh, from Saclaim. And he's talking about a singular limit of smooth microstate geometries. So please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Is the microphone okay? Cool. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the organizers for organizing co this conference. Uh, thank you for also giving me the opportunity to talk. And what I want to talk about today is um, some work which was going on in this group here in Saclay with a bunch of people who are also in the audience and also something that's been working on lately. Um, and the topic of this talk is basically how to deal with a very extreme corner of the parameter space of a family of smooth microstate geometries where it seems like something which initially does not have a horizon generally can develop a horizon. For those of you who are familiar with the fuzzball proposal, you know that this is a no-go. Our pro what I'm going to present today um, gives a little bit of an introduction of how we try to attempt to resolve this issue. Uh, so the outline of the talk is going to start with a brief introduction of the relevant key issues in the fuzzball proposal and then introduce the, the limit, the singular limit that we're trying to, uh, trying to work on. Um, ne next I'm going to tell you really what's going on, what is the problem, uh, what, is the, um, what is goes wrong when we take this uh, uh, go to this extreme corner of parameter. carries momentum in a new kind of way. And then finally, uh, once we find the solution is described by a very particular uh, set of BPS equations, six-dimensional supergravity coupled to a vector, additional vector multiplet. What we've done so um, recently is we linearize these BPS equations, which allows us to, um, in principle, construct super uh, smooth solutions in this new frame as well. And a uh, brief outlook of what is yet to come. So let's start with doing some basics. The first time we uh, we talk about black holes in undergraduate courses or in kindergarten, depending, usually associate some thermodynamic properties with them. And in particular, we know that we have to associate an entropy with them. Usually, when we think about uh, systems with entropy, we as we ask ourselves what are the corresponding microstates. And I think I ho hope this isn't a heretic statement to say that um, in even though semi-classical GR um, can give us a lot of information, we think that we should go beyond that theory to get some kind of resemblance of microstates, some explicit microstates. And one of the theories which um, should give us some insight of how to do this is string theory. And in fact, I think one of the main uh, results from string theory is in fact that it can allow us to reproduce the bekenstein hawking entropy by a, a nice counting argument. So these were, uh, for example, by, for supersymmetric, this was done by Schrom, and so on. But also there are other proposals from which later on in the afternoon by Horowitz and Ponchinsky, the correspondence point. Even though these kind of counting, all of these things still work some kind of in an ensemble way, right? The entropy of a black hole to an entropy of a large number of microscopic constituents. But then you still might ask, what are the individual There for the fuzzball holes? It's important to have answered the question, what is the role of the horizon in all of these solutions? Uh, and I think there are two ways you can think about this, and I think we will hear about those two things um, today. The first one is you can think of, okay, um, let me start by weak coupling. I have either I start with some fundamental string. It's kind of like it's in, as you have coupling, it's wiggling around. And then increase the string coupling, it will start to attract, it will collapse, and at some point it will, it, it can go behind the horizon, then the ho finite horizon forms. We'll think that, okay, all of these microstructures that you find at zero coupling, hidden behind a, fi a, a finite horizon. On the other hand, there's also been some, um, some results which say if you, if you not just have some fundamental string, but also have some bone structure, if you have an addition, you know, deep brain in your system, when you start to increase the coupling, the brains become slightly more if you especially on top of these brains, the brains start to expand, you increase the string coupling. And some results even show that if you, when you increase the string coupling, the brains actually um, the size of these um, microstructure um, is, goes exactly the same as the would-be horizon, but the horizon actually never forms. So in kind of principle, this is the spirit of the fuzzball proposal, where you actually never really form a horizon. Say is the horizon sets only the scale at which microstructures start to deviate from the standard black hole picture that we have. And in fact, it goes a little bit further. There exist e to the power of s explicit microstates which have this non-trivial structure. So the picture that we have in mind 
is, oops, wrong, wrong button, is that instead of having a black hole structure, what we will have is everything up to really this near horizon limit where the horizon would be, you have everything exactly the same, but then you have some really, some uh, extra degrees of freedom coming from either string theory or any kind of UV complete theory, where it, it allows you to have non-trivial horizon, and this resolves a lot of the issues that in, uh, in the uh, formation paradox, of entropy and so on and so forth. So, of course, the typical state might include arbitrary high energy, you know, might be slight, very quantum and so on and so forth. But as is usual, the classical, there should be a classical limit uh, consisting of really a coherent excitations of these quantum states, which should be visible in the classical theory or should be at least well approximated by it. And these are the states which are visible in supergravity. So the microstate geometries, which you know we've been talking about in the last few days, and will also be some um, uh, the focus of this talk. Regardless, it's important to know that it's crucial that whatever or not this uh, solution should be described within, um, within gravity or not, all microstates should be horizons. So finding a horizon is really a problem. You might ask, okay, so how do we av avoid the formation of a horizon? And the idea is that you know you go beyond the GR and you have these these extra degrees of freedom which allow you to support non-trivial structure at the horizon. And, and it's also, I'm going to stress this because this is going to be a problem for the, uh, for the next few slides, finite size horizons which will only arise due to some average or some incomplete decision of your theory. Um, and again, uh, stated in a different way, if you have a complete theory, if you believe you're in a complete theory, finite size horizons do not correspond to any pure state of the theory. So obviously, I'm, uh, I'm uh, emphasizing this because this goes wrong. We found a counterexample. Naively, we found a counterexample. It goes to one of the most studied examples that we've had in this microstate geometry, which are smooth microstates of the extremal B1, B5, B black hole. So this is super extremal. So everything I say will be in the realm of supersymmetry. So this is a limitation, but uh, for, for a good reason, because then we have something explicit to work with. Uh, the family that I'm going to work on is called superstrata. And the nice thing about these, so these are black holes, which are states which are syntactically uh, in you know you have four large space time dimensions so this is four comma one rather than three comma one space then you have an extra we single out an extra spatial um, uh, circle which is x y which will become important later and then you have some four uh, four dimensional internal manifold which we can frequently take p4 in this case when you take the near horizon limit as is usual you will get the ADS 3 plus p3 instead of um, uh, r4 comma one plus p and this is in fact a us to reduce ADS uh, CFP duality, and this is very important because superstrata are a particular family which have a well-known uh, CFP group. So this allows us really to use the full strength of the ADS CFP duality to also get some results from, for example, holographic calculations. And because these things are super symmetric, you can also use no, uh, non-normalization theorems to match some results from uh, the free orbital as well. So in particular, what these solutions look like, so we have the asymptotic region. I'm usually going to discard the asymptotic Pratt region. I should probably use the pointer here. Um, and I'm left with asymptotically ADS3 region, and you have a long but finite size probe, which ends in a smooth cap because of a lot of microstructure. I'm actually going to focus on some features of long coma and superstrata. These solutions are parameterized by three parameters. Of importance, I'm going to be only two, which sort of are related to the charges between the two here. So B relates to how much momentum you have in the y direction in the S1 circle, whereas A essentially counts A here. Small a essentially counts the number of um, s um, uh, um, number of momenta along the s three, and these two charge these two numbers are actually also important because in the holographic dictionary which, which was established is that these uh, solutions are dual to a coherent superpositions of states, um, um, and these two states in the Ramon Ramon sector are basically a bunch of plus plus strands b uh, plus plus strands with winding one. This is the same winding that uh, Sean was talking about yesterday. These um, very angular momentum, and the number of these basically determines these two charges. Whereas you have, and these should be sort of thought about as the background, as the supercube background in which you uh, perform these excitations. These kind of like adds to the momentum. And in fact, what you should think about is, I'll, I'll make this picture slightly more precise, that these are excitations on the supercube, and L minus one is the usual. Uh, Vera Soro operator, which kind of acts as a group along the xy direction. But, okay, I, I gave you this, uh, this limit, and in principle, these states are very well defined. So, yes, sorry, one question. Uh, I 
I think the, the, the redshift in between those two um, parameters, A and B, also determine the length of the probe. So in particular, you see that basically the value of B, you can think of these kind of solutions as sort of ADS free, and then the value of B determines where you throw away, where you make a cut and just a, uh, add a finite size uh, ADS piece to S1 probe, and the length of which is determined basically by the value of A. So you can have the maximum redshift is determined by setting A as low as possible. And I think it's determined, the redshift is sort of determined, I think, by A sub B, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the last case. B over A, B over A, yeah. Is it spring scale, is it Planck scale, is the Planck unit, spring unit? The oh. N no, no, I mean the A and B. Oh. So how far, how far, if I was thinking about it as a horizon, how far this state extends beyond the would be horizon, be beyond its would be horizon? look at the uh, distance and you measure the distance from this place to the horizon, the horizon is infinite. It's an extremal black hole. The horizon of an infinite black hole has an infinite depth. So if you just integrate DRR from the horizon of an extremal black hole to here, you'll get infinite. But then if you look at an infalling observer, which falls in, then the infalling, and, and you ask how much proper time of the infalling observer takes from the moment it reaches this stuff to the moment it would go to pass to the horizon, then it's actually one over n, n minus five, it's microscopic. So the answer is infinite and zero. It's an extremely black hole. It's very counterintuitive. I guess I'll have to ask it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but thank you for the question. It, it's actually imp quite important to know that basically as you take A to zero, this length of the probe becomes longer and longer and it goes bigger. Right, but I mean, if you have an um, extremal BCD black hole, this probe is essentially right. Um, so it's, it's kind of the uh, the question is kind of related to what I'm going to say next. In principle, I can assume A and B. A and B are not independent, but kind of like give you the cost of how many strands I have in the theory. So by increasing the amount of zero zero strand that I have in this theory, I'll just put that in later. Um, I should decrease the number of clusters, and basically. By increasing B, I'm kind of like, or by decreasing A, I can go into the space where the where the my the geometry approximates the black hole more and more. And as as long as A is sort of finite, this is fine. But in principle, nothing stops me from saying A goes to zero, taking A goes to zero strip. The state I'm going to uh, end up with is a relatively well defined CSP space, which consists of a zero zero strand. But on the global side, what you find is A goes to zero limit in the geometry. You find just the extreme of what it seems like is really what, we, uh, what we've been discussing before, that by taking A goes to zero really strictly, what you find is a geometry with a finite size horizon, but the dual CFP is pure. So this is for example to the fuzzball proposal. So now you have to figure out so what goes on. Um, the question that we want to ask, uh, that we want to answer here is can this horizon be resolved with gravity? Do they do exist, um, are they any, um, any trivial momentum carriers? which allow us to describe the system um, even in this particular limit. Yes? I think it's, um, it's um, I think it stabilizes at a different value. So you have the S and then it, it stabilizes at some other point. I don't know the precise value. The momentum charge determines the radius of the throat. And here the momentum charge is set by B squared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so. Emil. <laughs> so maybe to answer both that question and Rami's question. Um, so you really have to ask um, when you're talking about redshifts and so on, uh, relative to what? Uh, scale. So, so let's fix a scale. And a nice scale to fix is the place where 
the left of the figure, which is asymptotically ADS3, transitions to uh, some region which is uh, looking like ADS2 cross S1, okay? So what's the S1? The S1 is the angular um, uh, part of ADS3, the azimuthal circle of ADS3. So that's something which is decreasing exponentially as you come in radially. Eventually it hits some scale, what scale? The scale it's um, set by the momentum on that circle, which is QP. So that's the scale uh, B or root N times B that's on the figure. And now you, you, you transition from an ADS3 region where that circle is exponentially shrinking to the one where it's fixed uh, radius determined by QP, okay? So now you descend for some time in redshift, uh, uh, a while in redshift until you get to the scale set by A. A is the angular momentum that's carried by the solution. And at that point, the geometry stops being ADS2 times S1 and that azimuthal circle starts shrinking again. And so you have this cap region which looks locally like ADS3 again until you, you know, reach the center of space and, uh, and the space ends, okay? So the sort of the interesting thing here is to say, okay, let's fix QP and now let's dial the angular momentum. By dialing the angular momentum, you, set, you dial the scale A and you make the, red you make the redshift either longer or shorter. And he wants to take the limit A goes to zero, i.e. turning off all the angular momentum at which point gravity says that the cap should become infinitely redshifted and go to some extremal singular geometry. And so he wants to ask the question, if I understand correctly, what do you do to patch up this sort of fact that the cap has descended? In, is there anything that's sitting in the cap you know, that prevents it go from going to infinite redshift? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. This is precisely it. Emma was precisely right. This is um, this is what on. I, I forgot. And you take the throat, and this throat is finitely long, and then you have this um, another this free region, this smooth cap here. Um, the question why we want to resolve this in supergravity is also very important because we know from the two charge case, which was described by Kanichar, Skanderis, and Taylor a while ago, that these kind of these states, when you take the um, a goes to zero, you you work with um, you work with singlets of the symmetry. And what we know is that in the two charge case, these cannot be described within supergravity, or the argument is not described within supergravity. Unfortunately, these are also very interesting, because if you manage to find um, microstates with would be singlets, these, in the same paper, they made an argument that these would both give a very huge of entropy towards the calculus. So, you know, there are several interesting uh, motivations why we want to see these kind of, this kind of limit. Um, but before we go into that uh, region, I want to describe why Gong just from the right? um, and this is um, this is just a standard picture of how you construct these superstrata. Um, you start with something which is called around uh, D D5 supertube, and you by having a supertube with non-zero is A, and A is precisely the space which determines the number of plus plus strands of geometry. The next thing that you do you add along the radius of the supertube, so along the excitation. It will be single mode excitation of mode K, and this K attention of the dictionary determines the winding that you have. This is again the winding that we talked about yesterday. And the amplitude of this is called, uh, is we denote by B, and determines the number of zero, zero strands that you turn in your geometry. When this is small, this is just a sort of observation along the supertube radius, but when it's small, we have finite back and we get this, this kind of geometry. The final step that you want to do, so this kind of, um, this geometry, when you have the excitation, there's no excitation along the y direction, along this y, along the which this common direction is g1 to 5 brains. But then you act with the L minus 1, L minus 1 generators, and these kind of act as a boost along the y direction, and these then give you momentum. And then, uh, the amount of time you act with generators on the solution gives you the amount of wiggle. So in the end, you kind of have a doubly wiggly supertube. And once you back react this, what you get is your geometry that you discuss. But now, if you think about this, when you say A goes to Z, what will happen is you, de you, you decrease the circle along which you put your excitations in. So in principle, what you're asking is, okay, I'm going to decrease the circle 
and along the circumference of the circle, I'm gonna put an excitation. So of course, this is an ill-defined limit because what you're doing is you're suppressing all the oscillations in the possible direction on which you can put oscillations by taking the A goes to zero limit, what you're keeping is its effect. You're keeping the RMS value. So in, in effect, what you're doing is you're throwing around all of your momentum carriers while still keeping their effect. So the way it's a saying, we're skewing over the degrees of freedom which can actually carry the momentum, also keeping the result itself. If you think about this more from the gravitational side, connect to what I was saying yesterday, if you back super tube and the, 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 I think the origin, there is this cycle in which you have this flux, and when you take it goes to zero, this free sphere goes to zero, and then you kind of like, you'd ha you again, the effect is the same, you, the fluxes which carry the momentum has nowhere to be, uh, but you still keep their effect. So, goal, how do we resolve this? The goal is to find, can we find some momentum carriers which have vanishing angular momentum, so something which doesn't expand in the, in the R4. And I, the best way to think about it, there's actually two ways of doing so. The first one is you need to either involve the two degrees of freedom, so the degrees of freedom which oscillate along the internal direction, or you want to have some excitations which are actually longitudinal in S1 circle. So these are this some excitations which don't um, extend in the R4, but oscillate along the, uh, the SY circle, and these are well, essentially going to the, uh, choose the second option precisely because then we don't have to involve the T4. So we internal manifold. And it turns out that the best frame is actually tied to A frame, because there you, ha you work with actually the S and T dual of the D1, D5, P black hole, work with the S1 and S5, P black hole, and then you find that momentum can be carried by these four charges. So what you do, this T4, you wrap D4, uh, D, uh, D4 brains and then you have D0, which is smear along this manifold as well, but then you have some no, uh, local non-trivial density on the long S1 circle. If you're perhaps, un, um, if, if this sounds a little bit weird, you think it's in the S, the uplifter, the uplifter M2, which just wraps the, uh, ten, uh, the additional direction, but this non-trivial profile, this non-trivial longitudinal directions actually uh, combine with the NS5 to get a wiggling M5. So you get a non-zero, non-trivial M5 profile, and this profile of the M F5 FV, now this comes down to give you this longitudinal profile, this excitations. So how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, we are in circulation. What we do, we do a lot of dualities. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the fundamental string, uh, which um, fundamental string, which was the um, which we know the uh, you know the supergravity solution of by works from these uh, these authors. And what we're going to do, we're going to go along the one direction. This is going to be the winding direction add a non-trivial oxidation, a non-trivial profile along one of the directions of the So initially we start with the system which inherently breaks uh, in the sense of the t But then uh, we can do a bunch of t-dualities to make it something which is t4 variant. The fun thing that we want to do, if our goal is really to have something which has a non-trivial excitation, non-trivial profile along the y-circle, we're not allowed to do a t-duality along this circle because then it will take us out of the regime of the gravity. So the uh, chain of dualities we do is this. Uh, it's actually not important. The details are that important. The important thing is that we start the fundamental string, which has a non-trivial the below the line, oh <laughs> below the, the line I always call the dipolar charges, which integrate to zero when you uh, integrate over the y. And once you do all of these dualities, what you find is in the end, you have an NS5 brain with momentum. This momentum is carried by D0, D4 charges. So you start with some kind of asymmetry in the T4 directions, and by doing, by you undo them by, um, you know, by choosing this preferential direction when you do the T-duality. And the final, uh, final thing that we want to do is because this, uh, this con uh, configuration is still supersymmetric, we can use this enhanced supersymmetry in the ansatz. We know how to work with supersymmetry by, uh, by now very, very nicely. We can use this additional supersymmetry to just slap an additional fundamental string charge on top of it. So what we do we do is we have um, an NS5 brain which is, you know, has this 0 D4 charge and we add a very static F1 brain smeared along the T1, uh, T4. Um, just to give some uh, examples, you can show that this uh, configuration is preserved locally eight supercharges because 
um, these, um, because these modes are very specifically tuned coming from the fundamental string globally because of this value preserved for supercharges. So the same amount of supercharges as the D1, D5 black hole, but low looks like a two charge black hole. This will become, and you will, we will see the, we will see the, uh, this appear uh, later on uh, uh, explained. So this is the money shot of this, uh, this presentation. What we find, okay, so we're describing this configuration at the top and in terms of the string, free, uh, string frame metric and in terms of the Ramon Ramon field and gauge fields, this is the solution. You see that in most cases, it looked exactly what you would expect from the F1 and F, um, F1 S5 P. Oh, the only addition that you have is you see there's an additional, uh, there are additional terms which explicitly depends on this profile. And in fact, they depend on F, F dot. One interesting thing is, you know, we started with something which localized at a point on the R4, but you can see that all of the functions which are proportional to F dot, they have this weird factor one mono minus one over H5. So this is something weird. It's not localized at a point. It's actually a uh, it's actually like a, it has a peak, and this will become important later. It's kind of weird that you find something which you start with a configuration which is everything is localized at a single point in R4, but what you get something which is effectively smeared along the direction. Um, and still, you can, you, can do the, um, you can do the asymptotic analysis, and you find that the momentum is given by just uh, zero modes of, uh, of this distribution. So, okay, let us, um, the important thing is, so what happens near the, near the brains? So the first thing that you think uh, you can look at is you find that there is a horizon that R is equal to zero. So this is still a super, uh, this is still a um, singular, uh, singular solution. But actually, despite being a solution, what you find is that the horizon area vanishes. So this happens because now you have basically, uh, you can show that the radius of the Y circle now, instead of stabilizing that value which is determined by the, this asymptotic momentum actually pinches off at r is equal to zero. So this kind of goes against the standard picture that we have when we talk about the black holes where the r is equal to zero you have an equilibrium between the tension of brains and the pressure exerted by the momentum charge. And in fact one can go a little bit further by taking the near horizon limit and you find that basically it's essentially empty ADS3 cross S3. Uh, the only additional thing that you can see is you have a non-trivial non-trivial deformation of the metric, which, which is determined by f of v. All, all the other, so this ADS structure is supported by the NSNS flux, but all the Ramon-Ramon charges are basically vanishing. So to kind of explain this, one can plot the GV function, so this, uh, the, um, the metric somehow determines the momentum, not of the ADS3 structure, but from the, mm, the complete solution, and you can, compare it to the black hole. And what you find is comparatively, the red uh, line here determines the black hole. Instead of having something which really, uh, which has a peak at r is equal to zero, corresponding really to a point like source, what you find is that the distribution here is slightly more moderate and it's actually seems to be expanded. And when you analyze this a little bit further, what you find is that the peak is actually of the similar radius to ADS. So instead of having something which has a low point source at localized point source for the momentum at r is equal to zero, you find basically a two charge solution which has a null momentum wave running around at some finite distance, which is actually at the transition region. So in terms of that, it shouldn't be surprising that basically the near, ADA, uh, near horizon limit just captures this initial r squared growth. Um, and it's Im actually quite important is to see that you actually, when you take the near horizon limit, you don't get the full details of the solution. You actually, you, you kind of, when take it, you throw away the entire bump. You throw away the details of the of momentum carriers are. Um, and if you, okay, so just an uh, alternative way of how to see this, if you're unfamiliar with the D0, D4 charges, one of the things to think about is that you can reverse the chain of dualities that, uh, that, you, uh, that you started from F1P to and, uh, the final frame after you added this fundamental string and you find that this final, um, this final frame, you actually st get up, uh, end up with an NFP uh, F1 black hole, but now the momentum is carried by literally the same uh, F1 uh, strings with momentum along P4. So in the end, you can see that what we're doing now, essentially is we are with this D0, D4 charges, we're essentially probing the moment, uh, the along the internal direction. Um, 
So yeah, uh, if you look at perhaps another way of seeing this, if you're familiar with the D1, D5P system, if you look at this, this D0, D4 uh, momentum carriers really increases the T4 degrees of freedom of the D1, D5 system. Uh, however, um, from the six dimensional point of view, this solution and the solution that I t talked about before, actually kind of the same. In fact, if you actually go down to six dimensions, you will find that because of this additional factor, um, factor in the metric, you get an additional gauge field. So from the six dimensional point of view, the only thing that you, um, your, your system is described by supergravity with an additional vector. Still, the solution that we uh, described so far, this is still a singular solution, and in order to get something which is smooth, we will have to use the full, full we will have to solve the full equations of motion, we have to solve the BPS equations, and if that leads us to the, the final thing, we need to solve the BPS equations, uh, relevant system for 1, 0 supergravity, with coupled to a tensor and a vector multiple. Uh, luckily for us, these solutions have been described before in, uh, in the literature. However, the equations are slightly unruly, but what you can find, similar to what has been done before with systems which only involve tensor multiples, is that these this solutions, these BPS equations, can be appropriately linearized. And you can write encompasses the string theory origins of the solution. And in fact, this is the complete answer you can think of. This is the, uh, the new uh, H field completed with the two uh, B fields. Uh, a B field and a tensor field. Um, have a tensor field coming from a gravity multiple, a tensor field from a tensor multiple. So in the end, the free form is unconstrained anymore. So it's uh, appropriate. It's sort of um, convenient to write in in an independent way. And to think about this in a natural way, to you see that um, if you think about the F1 and S5P solution, the zero four brain charges, the Z ones corresponds to the sources vector sources of the fundamental strings, the Z5 correspond to co uh, the sources of the F for momentum and Z for D0, D4. And it turns out that once you, once you work a little bit with these equations, that um, the ZA, which is, uh, which is the DV component of um, the vector field, kind of naturally appears also in the momentum function here, so in the GVV component. And it's important to see that in our conventions, F is usually negative, whereas Z squared is fundamentally, squ uh, fundamentally positive. So there will be two competing contributions like this, where one will come from directly from the momentum charges and then the opposite effect from the, these um, from the vector field. Okay, um, most horrible slide of this. Of this. Uh, I just wanted to flash all of these equations here. The details of it, the complete details are not important. I also simplified them slightly because um, it's not important that I want to show you is again separate into a nice layered structure. What you see is uh, for people similar to, uh, familiar with the D1, D5 system, you again have a layered structure now, but now this additional vector field um, introduces a symmetry between your tensor field multiples. So the first uh, layer on the top, I've already, I've already um, fixed the base space. The first layer is exactly the same as the previous system. The second layer, it turns out that once you solve for uh, theta one and z two, you can go for the next layer, which is just again a self-duality condition for dA, and you generalize Laplace equation for zA. And once you have these solutions, only then you can go and solve the next tensor field equation, which between theta uh, theta two and z one. Usually, people who have been familiar with the d one d five system, tensor field equations are basically decoupled, and you can solve them simultaneously. A nice the way of you can think about this heuristically is that Z, uh, Z2 and theta1 correspond to NS5 brains, which are sort of the heaviest. So therefore, you have to solve them the fir uh, first. DA A and Z4 correspond to these D0 and 4 charges, which are slightly lighter. So then you have to, and they so you have to solve them next. And finally, you solve for the most light, uh, light elements of your string, which are the fundamental strings. Uh, last layer, you just need to solve, um, you need to solve back reaction of your solution. Most important thing of this is that the here, nice to solve. In particular, we have a structure that once you have a layer, the next layer can be solved in principle. You have only quadratic solutions. The same principle that we've been used that allowed us to construct all of these smooth solutions in the previous are also 
And uh, as I mentioned before, this vector field introduces a weird asymmetry between those two tensor models. Before I finish off, uh, let me just um, let me try to tell you what um, uh, how to use this solution to analyze the solution that we had previously. So as I said, the dictionary is uh, uh, we mentioned that the dictionary is as a such, and I can use the, si the solution for brain charges and them in. I found interestingly enough, even though I said that the, um, the functions which are related to the D0, D4 charges do not look harmonic, once you actually analyze it, you find that all of these Z functions which appear in, th in the ansatz and all of the F functions are actually harmonic and they actually need for the point sources in the, in the space. What is going on is in fact, if you remember that in the GVV, in the uh, uh, DV squared component of the metric, we have this particular combination. And when you take the near brain limit, actually the leading contributions cancel out. And they cancel out precisely then related to this uh, quadratic, um, quadratic um, 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 increase right near to the, the um Analyze this to just uh, further illustrate this point. Uh, once, you, once you put the background in, once you, uh, you realize that the PS equation you have to solve are just Laplacian equations in four dimensions solved by R one over R squared uh, solutions. Instead of having these general v-dependent uh, terms, I can just cook up, up an example where I put the QA and Q, uh, QP as in constants. Okay, so this is a very artificial example, um, and now the in principle no interpretation. The system now reduces the dimension as well because there's no v-dependent. But what you can do is then you can just plug this into the equation and look with your solution. It turns out but the first thing you notice is you start to look at and you find that r is equal to zero, this length is determined by the quadratic combination, um, which shouldn't be surprising from some results in terms of um, pi dimensional black holes that this quadratic, uh, quadratic invariant comes up. But the one thing that you notice is if I want to avoid closed time like curls, if I want the GV, the length of the y circle, I want the square of uh, a to be bounded by this number. Okay, so if that is the case, let me analyze what happens if I increase the amount of U1 charge. So standard uh, um, F1-5 Q black hole. Th I just start to increase the Q1, um, Q1 field, uh, QA uh, charge. Um, on the left, um, you will see you have the same GVV plot that we had before, and you see red corresponds to the, to the black hole, and as you increase the increase the QA charge, you see that this fundament, uh, this uh, kind of low price, the momentum starts to increase and it goes closer and closer to our, to our solution, which in fact is a, sat saturates this bound, but it, it's sort of like in a slightly more complicated way. Another way of seeing this perhaps is to uh, look at a similar, uh, to something, uh, to a plot, which determines the length of the Y circle, the radius of the Y circle, um, and you can show that there are, in, in general, the regions, the first one corresponds very far away, which is the asymptotic flat region where the circle is uh, stable at a constant radius, which for normalization reasons I take to be one. And, and as we talked before, there, there's um, close at region, which is where this R circle, this is where this R circle uh, starts to drop. And then at some point, at some scale, which is the, uh, the QA charge, uh, you transition back to the ADS2 uh, ADS2 probe. But you notice that if I saturate this bound, which is exactly what happens for our solution, you will get this ADS, you will ha have no ADS2 cos S1 probe. And uh, the physical interpretation of this is that these momentum charge characters we introduce have sort of a dual role. I think of this sound waves, sound lo lo longitudinal waves. So the first contribution comes from just having momentum, which you know comes from the comes from the charges. But on the other hand, you have that these charges source that you one field, which kind of acts in the opposite direction. So they kind of these two things cancel out, and they want to, uh, and in our solution, which comes from string field, these two effects precisely cancel out at R zero. Okay. Uh, so just to summarize what we have done have analyzed the singular limit of super strata, um, where when we look at the solution, we have a precise horizon in a very particular limit, 
and which is dual pure state, and we analyze is the cause of disappearance, what happens from the construction site point of view. Um, we show there exist explicit solutions, uh, what we analyze so, uh, right now, have uh, asymptotically free charges, but the solutions, even though they correspond to holes which have a finite size horizon, do not develop a finite size horizon. And the key ingredient for doing so is identifying new degrees of freedom which do not expand in the R, uh, in the R4. So these are singlets under the R4 space. Uh, we found some interesting solutions because of this, this, um, this um, absence horizon is due to uh, this tri non-trivial cancellation of field contributions to momentum and uh, its opposite direction. But one of the things that's uh, sort of puzzling is that when you take the new horizon, though you have some kind of structure, the new horizon limit seems to be empty. Uh, and we showed that this in the XMS DPS uh, system of equations we have added here at the field. Uh, so have we solved the problem? Uh, I might be skeptical in saying not yet. Um, obviously, we identified a mechanism which prevents the uh, large size horizon. In principle, what we would like to do is we would like to remove solution in this frame. We would like to uh, then see that the same mechanism can prevent the formation of any size of horizon. So now we have zero size horizon. There is still a horizon which has zero area. But in principle, what we want to do is we want to find some big solutions goes to zero limit and find whether the horizon is or not. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do in the couple of weeks, um, and, uh, in the last couple of weeks, and we haven't uh, we um, haven't done any any significant pro progress to show this. But one thing that might might actually be the case is that this empty near horizon region is rather a feature rather than a bug. So it might be that these solutions fundamentally live on the boundary. Okay, this, as as the title of this frame says, these are wild speculations. So this is not based on, um, this might not be true. Um, but it would be interesting to see if we can manage to do so, what is the holographic interpretation of this? These states should be in principle BPS, so we should have some kind of, they should have a counterpart in a CFT if they're supersymmetric, visible in the orbital point. Um, and perhaps one of the ideas might be, can, have, can we make some holographic in the CFT, which might point us towards some explanation, which uh, might give us some hint. Um, another which kind of crystallizes when we do so, uh, when we do these calculations, we see that T0, D4 uh, modes can be related to T4 degrees of freedom. So now there's the question, how important is the internal manifold in all these calculations? So far, all the super sort of the microstates that we built uh, have been built on sort of like an universal sector, which depend on the choice of the internal manifold. And now the question is, how much is the internal manifold important in, in general when you construct these systems? from what we saw yesterday from Pierre Stock, that the internal degrees of freedom, this internal structure is quite important to, um, to allow for some non-trivial structure the horizon, some condition. Um, the perhaps the question is, is the resolution fundamentally stringy in nature? Perhaps we have to go beyond supergravity to, to fully resolve this issue, and this might be uh, related to work which might uh, be described by Emil, or David, and Nico in the following weeks, uh, following days. Um, Perhaps on a slightly more curved question is, can we make this system that we described for the linear, uh, for the of just one vector field to general vector and tensor field, which allows to, you know, uh, have a much richer structure. Um, the, this uh, system was uh, studied by Kano and Ortin, but I think the linearization might really depend heavily on the choices of couplings between the tensor and the vector multiplets. And perhaps interestingly would be to uh, analyze this linearity to other be supersymmetric relates to symmetric systems, non supersymmetric systems. Uh, and I think that should be it. Thank you very much. Start from Daniel, then I come to you. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, can I? Um, so, in, in the D one D five, the two charge system, yeah. you have these. Uh, well, you have the lunar Mathura supertubes, which mm -hmm. have an extens extension in the mm -hmm. non compact space. But then you also, if you want to like count the complete entropy, you also take into account guys that are sort of singular, again, in the non compact space, but have like a profile on the T four. Yeah. So, um, so. 
could I sort of think of the, your guys as the three charge, uh, a three charge generalization of this idea? I think so. Yeah, I, that's that's how right. I would think about this, right? I mean, uh, ideally, this would right now what we've done is you you have this. Um, you have basically the one part of it is similar to Lunin Matur, but then you mm -hmm. would have to add this uh, this additional charge, which I don't know whether Lunin Matur can do. Um, right, right, right. Right, but I think yeah, I think the answer is yes. Okay. I think there, there would be some kind of generalization towards this to have you know non-trivial structure, non-trivial profiles along the T four. Right, exactly. And so then for sure the the internal manifold will be important. I mean, there you know from yeah you know the Lunin Matur thing. It depends on what you have a T four or K three, and then yeah. Uh, and then it depends. And so, do you do you have any expectation on, like there, you know, you count the guys in the non-compact space, you get <laughs> some finite fraction of the entropy. You count the guys on the compact space, you get another finite fraction. Um, but they're both sort of the same order. Here, I don't know. Do you have any? Yeah, unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. I okay. wouldn't. Uh, it's a bit different though because here the degrees of freedom are actually M theory degrees of freedom. I have one. The, the, the degrees of freedom are actually M theory degrees of freedom. So if you look at, the, uh, at this zero D4, you know, you are not having anything on the internal manifold. The internal D4 is still frozen. There's nothing happening there. So these degrees of freedom actually, they correspond to fluctuations, but they don't involve the T4, they involve the, they involve the, they involve the M theory direction. So it's a different flavor. Ah, so because you're not, you're not a, yeah, okay. But, so but the I guess T4 you, is you still frozen here. You want to generalize this to also yeah, uh, you, you can the, to the, the other one, right? Where you no, no, no. You cannot dualize the D1, D5, the F1 and S5 P frame with D0, D4 fluctuations to the, to the 2B frame we have. No. Yeah, okay, no. Not it's, it, I mean, if, uh, as three charge solutions, I don't think you can dualize them at yeah. all because, you know, you're basically, I mean, it, it, they depend on the, on the V direction. So yeah. normally you dualize on V to go from the type 2A frame to the type 2B frame. Can you yeah. throw, throw it in the... Oh, <laughs> it's a bit throw, it, throw it, throw <laughs> it. He's too British. Uh, gonna, uh, th th these things can also in the sort of in the M theory frame, and then really what you're doing is you're doing something on the M theory circle. But then that's like a T5 compactification of M theory. You could move the thing into the T4, I think, Joseph. And at which point you're now doing a T4. You, it, it's a it's a f mode on the torus of the T4. So I think there is probably a perfectly decent. ADS CFT interpretation in terms of expectations on the T4, and you can do that in 2A or 2B. The only reason you did it this way is because it's much easier to freeze out all the T4 degrees of freedom just through the supergravity analysis, and so it gives you a nice, nice picture. But I think, in principle, this is just activating the T4 degrees of freedom in a new and interesting way, and it's qualitatively, as you saw, because it delocalizes, it's qualitatively rather different from what we've seen before. So, do I understand correctly that the reason that things become trivial when you try to take an ADS3 decoupling limit is that the D0, D4 excitation is carried sort of outside the ADS3 region? Yeah, yeah. It seem th this seems to be the, the thing that we notice. Once you include the back action, it really seems that the localization where this momentum wave is localized is sort of at the boundary region between the ADS and the flat space in okay. this transition region. So follow-up question then. Um, so it's sometimes interesting to, to try to separate um, the, uh, to, to, to stage a hierarchy of decoupling limits. So instead of going directly from um, flat space to ADS, you can take a, s a hierarchy of decoupling limits where, and especially since you have your background yeah. NS5s, to take an NS5 decoupling limit first. So try to erase the one in the five frame harmonic function, keeping everything else. Yeah. Have you looked at that? Uh, we, we have tried it, but I don't remember the result. But I think that that's a possible way forward, where you start with the just the normal decoupling, the, the NS5 decoupling limits first. And that might be a way forward, rather than looking directly into the ADS3 limit to go into the that frame, uh, that decoupling might be slightly forced. But I don't remember the result. I don't think it works. I think it we tried. We would have made a big noise if it worked. I, we tried and it didn't work. So it's even carried outside the five brain throat? Yes, I think so. Okay. If you take the five brain, if it's, it's, it's the five brain harmonic function, which is really the bad one. Ah, oh, but actually. 
Actually, I have to take it back. We have one solution, which is not the, f the one with the 0D4, but which involves F1P. Yeah. Uh, and that one, I think you can take the NS5 decoupling limit. That's mm. a very good question. Right. I think we can take, we can have one which, put which, which goes inside the NS5 region. Yeah, so this one, right? So this one, when you do this calculation here, so, in pa oh, have I made it? No, I have not. No, it's the other uplift. It's the one we've been discussing recently, the one with F1P on the torus. Yeah, that, that's the one. That's the one here. Yes. That's here you notice that uh, here actually when you do this dualities, the F1, uh, the H5 and the H5, uh, H5 and H1 get changed. So H H5, which appears in in this uh, in this function here, is now actually uh, corresponds to uh, uh, H1s. So yeah. Thanks. That's that's very useful actually. Yeah. Okay. background that we have in front of us. So if you set f dot to zero, you get the pure NS5 F1 system, right? F dot to one. Uh, if you take f dot to, con to a constant, constant. and yeah. Okay. So in that case, the theory on a single long string would be something like alpha, which is a Liouville test, mm -hmm. and then SU2 times P4. Unfortunately, no, uh, that, that is out of, I mean, I, I know that uh, people have been working on this, but uh, that is out of my expertise, unfortunately. No, but I, I, this is a very important question because the reason why we use this, uh, this background is because it's early NSNS, right? So this might be interesting for other purposes, but unfortunately that is out of my. Um, but what would be the theory, the, 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 the free theory, the, the RB4 theory in the, in the other frame? Like it was P4 to the power n mod Fn kind mm -hmm. of thing before you add the f dot. Yeah. So now what's going to be the RB4 uh, theory? Should be the same, right? I, I, I would I say it's the same. It's just the same asymptotics. It's just the same. I mean, the yeah. type 2 and the type to be F1 and S5 system, they are part of the same, they have the same CFT dual. I mean, the, the pure default is dual to everybody and their brother. You know, D1, D5, F1, and S5 in type 2, yeah. F1, and S5 in type 2, B. All, the all the dualities are just moving amongst supergravity theories, but there's a single pure default point. Okay. So I think it's the same, it's the same pure default theory, but it's just dual to all these guys. So those guys are going to describe some states of the pure default CFT, but, you know, which don't have a type to be clean in the interpretation. So. another way I mean you know the things that we've tended to use to build superstrata carry our symmetry that's what makes them fat in the space time they, they they have a leg that sticks the polarization tensors tend to have a leg that sticks out in the space time so the particular charge carriers we're using here or the particular dual states are things that are entirely internal to the system and don't carry any R symmetry that's why they have F their SO4 singlets and so those that's what makes them you know qualitatively different and I think probably very interesting Okay, yeah, maybe More I just want to add uh, uh, one point on this. I mean, but if they don't carry any R, R symmetry charge, how can they be BPS, right? They are. I mean, usually uh, from the CFT point of view, I think a BPS condition being H equals J. Equal J. Right, but it's the J of the F3, right? Usually, I, I mean, I, I, I another thing which makes me suspect that you need to go beyond supergravity is uh, when you describe the uh, superstratum states, right, as you said that these are uh, coherent superposition. So mm -hmm. you have two ingredients, yeah. but you don't have fixed number, right? So you, you have a coherent superposition and this number, the average number of the constituents has to be large, yeah. right? When you take A equal to zero limit, you don't have a coherent superposition anymore, right? Yeah. You, have a, you have just a state. So I had the naive suspicion that then you driven to a stringy state. Yeah. I think I can answer that. It's possible, so it's possible, notice that this solution still has a horizon, it's still singular, but the horizon area is zero, so it's an improvement. Now, w if you want to make a uh, microstate geometry out of this, you might actually have to once again reinvade the space time and make it big and fat. But the nice thing about these momentum carriers is when you take the A goes to zero limit, you don't wind up with something with a finite size horizon. You wind up with something with a zero hori size horizon, which means its resolution must be intrinsically stringy. So I think that's how this is probably going to work. Yeah, Monica had a question. Mm. Monica had a question. Mm. Oh. Okay. I can see. More questions? Okay, then 
there are no more questions, let's thank Nate again.